When you hear the word promoter, you typically think they should, you know, promote. In an effort to justify taking our money and time, fight promoters typically elevate the status of their athletes by playing up their accomplishments, speaking to their strengths and potential while lowering the volume of criticisms tossed in their direction. Oftentimes, this rose-colored speech can be hyperbolic or bend the reality to the point of plain old lying. Dana White is no stranger to this behavior and deserves a tremendous amount of credit for growing the UFC from a struggling money pit to a global powerhouse and ATM for parent company Endeavor. But despite that success, Dana has been known to violate the dictionary definition of promotion. Strangely enough, he's found a way to do just the opposite. In fact, when the men and women he's speaking of have walked away with wins. What's up everyone, Jason here. Just want to give a quick shout out to Caveman Coffee for teaming up with us on the championship series. And guess what? I got a fever. We are offering $30 off of the entire championship series package. So that includes the shirt, the coffee beans, the mug, and you even get a free second one if you use the code MMA on point at checkout. Links are in the description. And with that being said, these are 10 times Dana White buried his own fighters after a win? Number 10, Czech Congo at UFC 149. This event will either be forgotten or remembered for being one of the least entertaining cards in the promotion's modern history. Without a single finish on the main card aside from the Matt Riddle submission that was changed to a no contest and a slow paced technical five round decision in the main event, it didn't exactly thrill the capacity crowd in the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. Until when Dana stepped to the podium in the post fight presser to express his displeasure with the event, one particular fight drew his ire more more than the others. Czech Congo versus Sean Jordan. The majority of the 15 minutes was spent inside clinches against the fence with very little effective offense on either side. There simply wasn't much to love here. And in typical Dana fashion, he shared his frustrations to anyone who cared to listen. He blasted referee Eve Levine for allowing the action to repeatedly stall. I think there were a lot of things that went wrong. I felt like I was at UFC 33 again. As a referee, your job is to enforce the rules and make sure that these guys fight. But he turned his attention back to the fighters, calling for the two disengaging in open stances and essentially pinning one another to the fence for the duration of the entire bout. I think that, that, that Czech Congo and, and, and uh, Jordan pushed against the fence for three rounds. And then in the third round, they clinched for an entire five minutes. This is the ultimate clinching championship. It's the fighting championship. Number nine, Frank Mir at UFC 119. Again, we have another contender for one of the worst events in the promotion's history. With only four of the 11 fights on the card being able to avoid a decision, it was a night that was light on action. The disappointment was especially thanks to the main event. The pairing of Frank Mir and Krokop promised a great heavyweight bout between two legends and premier finishers. And with less than a minute left, Mir made good on that promise, landing a knee that sent Krokop to sleep. As the only knockout in the entire event, you would think the knockout of the night bonus was a lock, right? Well, Dana had a different idea. Instead of awarding the bonus to the lone KO of the night, he decided to keep that 70k for his imported snow fund, almost putting into words what the booing fans were likely thinking at the Canseco Fieldhouse, why question the largely uneventful clinch battle. Likening the former champion to the Grinch, he stated that Mir lacked heart and shrink when he realized he couldn't bully Krokop. I, I, I was disappointed. I was disappointed in Mir's performance. I was disappointed in, uh, in, in, the, in the fight overall as the main event. Pointing out Mir's tendency to trash talk his opponents, White went on to float the possibility of cutting him from the roster altogether. Number eight, Curtis Blades at UFC on ESPN 11. What happens when you combine a powerful heavyweight with whose game is based on stellar wrestling skills against a lanky kickboxer who needs space to operate in a small cage? Exactly, a grind fest with positional battles and a divisional record of 14 takedowns despite gassing late in the fight. At least when Curtis Blades and Alexander Volkov shared main event duties, Blades had the decency to warn us that he wouldn't exactly appease our bloodlust with a stand-up war. After getting the W in the fight that had much significance in the heavyweight high hierarchy, Dana wasted no time in criticizing the victor. Citing his fight week tweet that warned fans about his strategy, the UFC president said, when you talk the shit that he talked and performed like you performed tonight, you look stupid talking about ragdolling people and he's not getting paid. And, you know, he gassed out at the end of the third round. 
made it to the fifth and won the fight. Reluctantly acknowledging that he was just behind the only man to beat him, Francis Ngannou, in the title picture, White went on to encourage Blades to stay active and help iron out his gas tank issues. With his performance tonight and his cardio, I wouldn't wait around if I was him. I'd stay active. I'd stay busy. But perhaps the true source of his displeasure came from the complaints Blades made about fighter pay. Speaking to CBS's State of Combat podcast, Blades pointed out the presence of ESPN and the reported 16% of revenue that went to the UFC's roster. He undoubtedly ruffled some feathers, which Dana very gingerly mentioned before continuing to criticize the top-ranked heavyweight. Number 7. Forrest Griffin at UFC 148 One thing Dana White is definitely known for is not holding back anything on his mind. So when Ariel Wani asked about Forrest Griffin at UFC 148, his quote, is this live? Should have started a chorus of alarm bells. Following a close back and forth trilogy fight between Griffin and fellow former lightweight heavyweight champion Tito Ortiz, Griffin decided it was time to leave the cage. Without as much as even waiting for the judges to add up their scorecards, much less Bruce Buffer reading them out loud, Dana chased after him as the commentary responded with pure confusion at the bizarre scene. Upon his return to the cage, Griffin took the mic from Joe Rogan and conducted the post-fight interview. Needless to say, Dana was not pleased and made it very clear to everyone watching the post-fight show on Fuel. I said, are you out of mind? What are you doing? Stay in the octagon. It's like professional suicide. You leave the octagon before the decision is called in the fight that you want. Do you, are you out of your mind? And then stay away from the microphone unless Joe Rogan's interviewing you, okay? I don't know if you're, you're bucking for a new job and you want Joe's position, but it isn't happening tonight. Interestingly, it would actually be Griffin's last fight, and he'd be put into a six-figure salary executive position with the company while Ortiz ended his retirement super quick to compete in Bellator, and let's be real, he'll probably compete again, which at this point is almost 10 years later. Number six, Chris Cyborg at UFC 240. The relationship between Cyborg and Dana White has never been completely friendly. We could probably make a video just on the numerous jabs the two have thrown at one another over the years, but any thoughts that time had healed the wounds and their business dealings could carry on would be buried following UFC 240. After dominating Felicia Spencer in the co-main event, the UFC president went out of his way to minimize what she did that night. When a reporter questioned whether Spencer making it to the final bell was an indication she was past her prime, Dana took that baton and ran way past the finish line. When, you know, Cyborg thought that I was talking um, shit about her. You start to get a point uh, to a point in your career where you start to look at, you know, I'm getting older and, and those type of things. When you know you're at that point in your career, this is the, the absolute best fight here. We find the absolute best and these are all killers that are that, that are here in the UFC. What? What are you talking about? Instead of praising her clean sweep on the judges' scorecards, White instead highlighted the chin and toughness of Spencer. The girl she fought tonight has a ridiculous chin unbelievable elbows, a ton of heart, and she showed up. She didn't show up for a paycheck tonight. She showed up to try to win. This became the straw that broke the camel's back, leading their fragile alliance to a complete collapse. Cyborg then released a doctored video, which was pretty strange, that appeared to show Dana admitting to her that he lied in public statements, and he retaliated by going on a smear campaign that included one of the most vintage scrum rants and a sit-down with Lorisenko filled with revisionist history. First of all, I never came out and bullied or said anything about Cyborg. I was asked a question by the media. So now for, you know, hacks to throw up, you know, a 15-second clip, of me saying that's completely taken out of context. I said, when I saw her at the MMA awards, she looked like Vanderlei Silva in a dress and heels. And she did. So you're telling me that clip we just played was out of context. How? How could that possibly be out of context? The end result was that Cyborg would move on to Bellator and the UFC happily shut the door right behind her. <sighs> I want that Cyborg Nunez rematch though, damn it. Number five, Uriah Hall at UFC Fight Night 181. 
The legend of Anderson Silva needs no setup here. We all know his reign at the top of the middleweight division was highlighted by stunning finishes that pushed him into acclaim across the entire sports world. Fast forward to UFC Fight Night 181 with his championship days firmly in the past and nearing the end of his tenure in the octagon, he was booked to face Uriah Hall. Hall would earn the win by devastating knockout and the stage was set for Silva to retire and Hall cementing his place in the top 10 of the division. Except that Silva's likely departure from the UFC meant he could be of value to some of the other promotions around the world, so White's response? Let's just trash the shit out of Uriah Hall. At the post-fight presser, Kevin Ioli cited Silva's early success in the bout, which led to Dana questioning the legitimacy of his opponent. Let's not forget he fought the current champ, Israel Adesanya, about a year and a half from then. No questions from Dana there. He fought, he fought a guy that has absolutely zero output. They're in a five-round main event on ESPN. They threw 11 punches in the fucking second round. And despite having seven KO wins in the UFC, not including the destruction he inflicted upon the Tough House, Uriah Hall is one of the most gun-shy fighters in the UFC. You fight any of these other savages, you know what I mean? He'll be in big trouble, and he'll take a shitload of punishment. While it looks like the devaluing of the spider maybe has worked in the short term as other promotions have backed off a legendary free agent, either that or they're just broke like everyone else is from COVID, I don't know. Meanwhile, Uriah Hall is a top 10 fighter in search of a promoter that believes in him or just wants to promote him a little bit. Oh, and he didn't throw just 11 shots in round two like Dana had claimed. He literally threw almost three times that amount. Just look at the fight metrics. God, Dana, the guy won, he won. What are you talking about? Why are you bashing a fighter who just knocked somebody out? Number four, Tyron Woodley at UFC 214. If you ask most fans what their least favorite title fight is, you're almost guaranteed to hear someone say, Woodley's defense of the welterweight title against Damian Mai at UFC 214. To be fair, it was really bad. Yeah, it was just bad. But seeming to forget that it was his duty to sell Woodley's future fights, Dana went nuclear on the champion, questioning why anyone would want to watch him fight at the post-fight presser. Listen, when you break a record for the less punch, the least punches ever thrown in a five-round fight, in a title fight, it was like 130, and these guys threw 60 or something like that. I mean, I think that sums it up. But when you get booed out of an arena, it means people don't want to watch you fight. And that's how you make a living. It's not good if people don't want to watch a fight. It was a scorching for the ages. When Megan Olivi brought up the 21 takedown attempts that Woodley stuffed, Dana dismissed it with his signature brand of Venom. No, not that Venom. As I said, you broke a record tonight. I mean, that, that speaks for itself. However many, 17 takedown attempts or something like that. And I said, yeah, and the guy had one eye in the first round. And the most damning moments came courtesy of the anticipated return of George St. Pierre. With Woodley holding that belt that GSP vacated, it only seemed natural that the GOAT candidate would look to reclaim the welterweight division. But Dana squashed that speculation and left nothing to interpretation. GSP, who you said was next in line yep. for this winner, is no longer next in line. He's fighting Michael Bisping. Yep. Is, that, is that definitive? Yep. Michael Bisping will show up and he will fight. So yeah, I'm going to give it to him. But to be fair to Dana here, I don't blame him for hating this fight. It was just bad. But you probably don't have to go that hard on your own fighter either. Number three, Anderson Silva at UFC 112. We typically have to wait at least for the post-fight presser to begin to know exactly how Dana feels. At UFC 112, we knew before the final bell had rung for the main event. While his antics against Damian Meyer were still in progress, Anderson Silva irritated the UFC president so badly that he passed the belt to Silva's manager and left the arena floor during the fourth round. So of course, he had a lot to say backstage. Fresh after acquiring new ownership partners in Abu Dhabi, AKA now known as Fight Island, Zufa intended to impress them with a star-studded card headlined by the spider. So with freshly cracked egg on his face, White let loose. What happened tonight was an absolute disgrace, an embarrassment for the UFC, an embarrassment for the sport, and, and I'm, I, I don't know if I've ever been more embarrassed than I am tonight. He doesn't deserve to fight GSP. That's not the best of his ability. When he spoke with Ari Iwani after the press conference, he revealed that he's waiting for me. I just sent them to my uh, trailer. He feels that he doesn't owe the fans an apology. As far as him fighting again and what else, I, I, I can't even think about it right now. Days later, Silva's manager would issue an apology. Oh, to be a fly in the wall in that room. Number two, Mike Jackson, UFC 225. To call the CM Punk experiment a strange failure for the UFC would be an understatement. The former WWE 
WWE Champion spent two years training since his signing was announced, only to be quickly submitted by Mickey Gall at UFC 203. Almost another two years later, the UFC would call him back to the octagon against the man Gall finished on his way to CM Punk, part-time boxer and kickboxer Mike Jackson at UFC 225. While Gall was able to take advantage of the man born Phil Brooks on the floor, Jackson would do the same on the feet, controlling nearly every second of the full 15 minutes. Jackson dominated and landed at will, denying the takedown attempts and earning 10 8s from each of the three judges and multiple 10 8 rounds from most of the media scorecards. Afterwards, White seemed to not have a nice thing to say about Jackson's performance, but was generous in his praise of Brooks. What? We gave him two shots, you know, and, and he had a lot of heart tonight. He got clipped a lot in that fight. And he, it looked like he was hurt bad a couple of times. And he stayed in there. He went for three rounds, you know. But the man who delivered said beating was skewered for his apparent showboating and not finishing the fight. Michael Jackson, I'm not happy with. You get this opportunity to come in and fight CM Punk and you're doing like bolo punches to the body on top. Looked like he could have finished the fight a few times. Never tried. I got the sense that, that he's a complete fucking idiot and uh, I couldn't wait for that fight to end and I regretted not putting it on Fight Pass. I don't know what that guy did for a living before we gave him the shot, but whatever it was, he needs to go back and do that again. And yeah, to be honest, I kind of sided with Dane on this one, just like I do for the past two entries. And number one, GSP at UFC 167. The aftermath of this bout gave us perhaps the best glimpse of Dana White at his angriest. Immediately following the controversial main event, which saw George St. Pierre narrowly defeat Johnny Hendricks to defend the welterweight belt, White unleashed an epic tirade for the ages when media gathered at the MGM Grand. Does anybody here think that Johnny Hendricks didn't win the fight? It's about damage. This is a fight. I'm blown away that George St. Pierre won that fight. He's the biggest pay-per-view star on, on the planet for me, and I still don't think he won that fight. I think the Nevada State Athletic Commission is atrocious. The governor needs to step in and fix the incompetence that is happening in the state of Nevada that used to be the best commission in the world. When a reporter present at the press conference asked Dana whether or not he should at least talk to St. Pierre before publicly damning him, he shot the notion down without hesitation. First of all, that decision that happens, maybe I'll be back, maybe I won't. You owe it to the fans, you owe it to that belt, you owe it to this company, and you owe it to Johnny Hendricks to give him that opportunity to, to, to fight again. If that didn't make things awkward enough, despite Dana's insistence that the champ was at the hospital, a battered St. Pierre made a surprise appearance. White then cooled off a bit after speaking with GSP and gave the media a much more composed scrum. He had a calmer tone, but didn't back down from any of his previous comments. There you go, I guess. And real quick, I just want to give another shout out to Caveman Coffee for teaming up with us and supporting us with the championship series. And right now they are offering a very special discount of $30 off on the entire championship series package. So you get this shirt, you get the coffee beans, the gold mug, and if you use the code MMA on point at checkout, you get a second gold mug for free. And real quick, guys, I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to Caveman Coffee for supporting us. If you've noticed, we've been doing all kinds of crazy videos lately that cost a lot, travel, expenses, hiring out people, all these different things. It just would not be possible without what Caveman Coffee is doing for us. So it's really important that you support them because they do support us. So with that being said, click the link in the description. Use the code MMA on point at checkout to get that deal and we'll see you on the next video. I'd like to give a huge thank you to the writer of this list, the man, my buddy, Anthony Walker. You can follow him on Twitter at AntWalkerMMA. And then of course the video editor for this list, and that is Lawton Vierkant. I think we're slowly working him up to the moderate from the casual. He's making progress, guys. You can follow him on Twitter at Lawton underscore Vierkant. And lastly, thanks to Ben Rosette for writing the intro music. You can find all of his music wherever music is available online, as well as follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Rosette. Hey everybody, thanks for watching that video. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. We do at least three video uploads per week, so you get a pretty good value out of it. Comment below if we miss anything or if you just liked it. You can follow me personally on Twitter at JasonTheHeart or our official account at OnPointMMA on Twitter. And if you'd like to get a little bit more involved in our community, you can join us on Discord. The links are in the description. Thanks so much, and we'll see you on the next video.